so welcome. So I'm Nita McKinley. If you uh, don't know me, I'm the chair of the faculty assembly. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this distinguished teacher um, talk. Um, I want to thank Mary Smith, who's the administrative coordinator for faculty assembly, who organized all this and the delicious food and drinks over there. Um, so uh, you can thank her if you get a chance. Um, so I have the uh, honor to be able to introduce to you uh, the 2014 Distinguished Teaching Award winner, um, Dr. Donald Chin. Um, Dr. Chin is Associate Professor at the Institute of Technology. He received his bachelor's degree in computer sciences from UC Berkeley and his PhD in computer sciences and engineering from UT Seattle. Um, he joined uh, UWT and the Institute in 2002, so we've had him now for a long time. He started the same year I did, so we're 12 years now. Um, and uh, Donald is well known on campus, um, and he is going to uh, give his speech today entitled, and I had to look these up, but I know that some of you didn't, so you get bonus points if you didn't have to look these up. Uh, Keating, Kingsfield, and Watson, Reflections on the Fiction and Reality of Teaching. It's great to see so many friends and colleagues here uh, to take time out of your busy day uh, for this gathering. Uh, I hope to make it worth your while. Um, oh, okay, let's, okay. Water, keyboard. Um, I, I, let me just say a couple quick things that is not on the script, which is that uh, just before uh, this gathering here, I tried to go through my slides uh, for the talk and just say what I wanted to say without having to refer to any notes or whatever, and it was an utter failure. So uh, I apologize that I'm going to, I, but however, I have written down everything I want to say. So, uh, so if, I, if I end up looking like this, you know, for the most part, and uh, then that's because I'm doing that. So I apologize for, you won't get the classroom experience, I guess is what, I, is what, I guess is what I'm saying. So I apologize in advance. Um, so, uh, okay, so yes, I have deliberately put uh, some mysterious names here. Some of you know who they are, and, but others don't, so I'll leave you in suspense for those who haven't. Um, okay, uh, so uh, just a few quick uh, things about the award. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the uh, UW Tacoma, of course, and the Office of Academic Affairs that supports this award, uh, the Distinguished Teaching Award Committee, who uh, I guess chose me, um, and the Faculty Assembly for arranging this talk and everything else that goes on behind the scenes uh, regarding this award. Um, I've actually been uh, thinking about this award for the, after the, since uh, it was announced many months ago, and I was thinking uh, it's obviously quite an honor to receive this award, but I realized that um, the award really isn't about me. It's really about teaching, and it's about this university's commitment to teaching. And so uh, I think it's symbolic of all the hard work that everybody does on campus, in the labs, in the classroom, internships with students, you know, the ways in which we interact with students uh, on this campus is just so, met, uh, so many and so much. Um, so, uh, you know, this university and any university has its foundations in teaching, and I, so I think this award really is symbolic of, of all that effort. So. Uh, so when I say all of us in terms of all the hard work that all of us do, uh, I'm talking about not just faculty, of course, I'm also talking about the advisors and staff and administration and the maintenance staff who keep the you know, campus looking great. Um, you know, we all contribute to making, uh, uh, creating conditions under which te good teaching can occur. Um, I also want to say congratulations to all the uh, nominees for the award. Um, I look at the, I have looked at the list of nominees and I say, you know, we got a lot of good teachers on at UWT. Um, and uh, I dare say that any of the nominees potentially could have been chosen as the award winner, so I'm uh, a bit humbled by actually being chosen. And which got me to thinking, you know, whenever I watch the Academy Awards, uh, whoever wins the award usually gets up there, you know, with the trophy and says, you know, oh, you guys, all you other nominees are fantastic, you do great work, and you, you know, and the cynic in me says, 
you know, that, uh, that they say that in order to boost their own accomplishment. You know, basic, basic, basically, basically what they're saying is, you know, you guys are all great, but I'm better, you know. And so, uh, and, and I realize that now that I'm in a similar situation, that they're actually probably being sincere and as opposed to uh, uh, trying to boost themselves. I think they care about their art and they want to see recognition uh, for, uh, for work that is good. And so... So to all the other nominees and to all the other uh, great teachers on campus who care about deeply about their work and their teaching and perhaps were not nominated, I say bravo and keep up the good work. I also want to uh, take a few months take, to thank a few people who have had a profound impact on my thinking regarding teaching and just in general. And uh, I should have thought about this more uh, uh, before uh, for making this slide. I, I'm going to reveal them all at once, whereas I should probably do them one at a time, but I'm just going to do it all at once. So I, actually, there's too many people to, to thank here, and so, but I just wanted to point out a few people. Uh, Tammy Vandergrift is a professor at the University of Portland, and she was the first person who actually introduced me to the idea of active learning uh, about 15 years ago. And so, you know, back then it was, uh, it was a bit of a newfangled term, and it seemed uh, uh, seemed kind of, hmm, I'm not so sure, but now it's, of course, uh, sort of standard good practice. Uh, my colleagues at the Institute, Alan Fowler and Josh Tenenberg, uh, if you ever have a conversation with either of them about teaching, um, a conversation in just a couple hours or whatever, uh, is you'll probably learn more about teaching in that amount of time than you would if you taught a course for a whole year. Um, so, uh, uh, so the insights and ideas that I've gotten from them are, are valuable, and I hope I've... Uh, influence their views on teaching as well. Sam Chung is another uh, colleague in the Institute. Uh, he is uh, currently, yeah, he's left the Institute and he's now at Southern Illinois University. Uh, and uh, the thing about him is that he has, he had a lab right across from my office, uh, right here in Cherry Parks. And uh, what I, what was inspiring about Sam was that uh, he had this lab and there would be all these students and there was just all this activity and that, that energy was just so inspiring. Uh, June Lohenberg, uh, many of you know June Lohenberg. Uh, actually, I don't think I need to say very much. She's just awesome. So I'll just, I'll just, leave, I'll just leave it at that. Um, this is off script, by the way. It's not what I have here on, on the... Uh, the late Robert Howard, um, he was a professor here at the, uh, in the education program here at UW-Tacoma. Uh, he had an influence on me in a number of ways. One was that he, uh, when, I, when I came to UW-Tacoma, he uh, was the chair of this committee called the Committee for the Retention of Assistant Professors. And, uh, 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 and he also, the other way he influenced me was his views on character-based education and citizenship. I, I, and I wish I'd had more time to talk with him about that. Uh, when he got tenure, uh, I became the chair of the committee for uh, the retention uh, of assistant professors. In fact, he gave me this t-shirt. Here it is. Uh, it has my name over here. Uh, you probably can't see it, but there's a little crown. These are all iron-on things. And uh, uh, on the back it has, it says this. <laughs> So when, I, when, I, when he got tenure, I became chair, and uh, he gave me this t-shirt, and he dubbed me king of crap. And I was happy to sit on the throne. <laughs> Wherever you are, Bob, I miss you. Finally, I'd like to mention my parents who taught me about hard work and uh, just doing things well. I think that's, that's an important uh, life lesson. And in the spirit of bad teaching, uh, what I'm going to do is blast lots of ideas at you in, in the hopes that some of it sticks or inspires you. Here's the outline for today. Um, I want to quickly talk about some early high school and college learning experiences that I had, then uh, talk about some of my college teaching experiences, then I want to talk, give some a little bit of advice to some new teachers, which I don't see very many new teachers here, so, so maybe this is just going to be completely lost on, on, on the world. Uh, but maybe, since this is being taped, uh, maybe, maybe this could have some uh, benefit to the, to the world at large. And then I'd like to give a few thoughts on the future. 
Uh, again, my main focus, unfortunately, <laughs> okay, I am going on script now. Uh, my main focus is uh, my advice to new teachers, uh, but that may be a bad idea. Um, but for those of you who have taught for a while, hopefully you can pick up something or be inspired to watch a book or a movie or pick up a new tip that you maybe you want to try out in your class. Who knows? Oops. Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, here's a, I just want to start off with a few stories, and it, uh, you know. There's no, not necessarily a rhyme or reason to any of this. These are just things that have stood out when I was thinking about giving this talk. Uh, high school calculus. My calculus teacher in high school assigned no homework. Okay? So we had only chapter tests and pop quizzes. Okay? And haven't been used to sort of the regular uh, uh, homework as, as sort of the norm for math. Uh, this was a little bit unorthodox. Um, so what she would do is, after a mini lecture, she'd just let us loose on the problems. You know, we could do whatever we want. We had free time, you know, where we could either work on the problems, talk to each other, whatever. You know, a lot of times we goofed off. It was great. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, we would goof off during the free time. Uh, but that's where the pop quizzes came in. So she could sense, of course, when you know when we, you know, were getting it or weren't uh, getting it or not. And so uh, that kept us on our toes. And so after a while, we figured, oh, yeah, we actually better be doing some work. Yes, we could do a little bit of socializing and talking about things that have nothing to do with calculus. Uh, but, uh, but in the end, we realized, oh, we've got to learn this stuff. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get lousy grades and whatever. So, um, so the net result was that instead of doing the five or ten problems that we would have done, uh, uh, you know, if she had assigned them, or however many she would have signed. Guess what? We ended up doing all the problems in the back of the book, in the back of the chapter, you know. And so that was interesting. That was an interesting experience to me. That's the only time I've ever had that experience. Um, and we were all well prepared going into college calculus. Uh, but I've never had the courage to try that in my own classes. And I, I've, I've talked about that, actually, uh, to, to my students. In fact, sometimes I say, sometimes when they complain maybe about that there's too much homework, I say, well, you know, I had this high school calculus teacher who didn't assign any, you know, uh, and, and I, t I told him exactly the story that I just told you. And so I would say, you know, we ended up doing all the problems. And so I suggest you do all the problems. You should do all the problems. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know what the <laughs> net result is actually. Um, okay, college calculus, obvious trivial. Um, when I was in calculus as a freshman, uh, we had a professor who happened to be the co-author of the textbook we were using. But imagine, so imagine Berkeley, 400 something students in a large auditorium uh, taking calculus, engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, and maybe some business people. Um, and he was a good speaker. Um, but he would sometimes, when he would solve a problem, if there was an easy step, he would say, well, obviously, such and such, and da, da, da. Uh, maybe you've had that experience in your math, cl uh, math classes. Or at the end of a, after he had completed solving some problem or procedure or whatever, he would say, it's trivial, you know. And in fact, it got to be this running joke. It, it, was, it was hilarious, actually. Uh, I actually had him for two semesters, both the, you know, fresh, uh, the first uh, semester of calculus and then the second. So by the second semester, a lot of us have had him you know, for you know, six months or whatever. And so sometimes he would just say at the end of the thing, he would just actually, it's trivial. And he, he was almost making fun of himself. It was, it was kind of hilarious. Um, in fact, after one time, after you know, I think it was in the second semester uh, of calculus, he did that once. And it was just, you know, after a while, it was like, ha, ha. The first few times, it's ha, ha, ha. But after a while, it was like silence, right? And so he did that, and somebody in the back y uh, yelled out a sarcastic, sarcastic, ha, ha. And, and uh, then he said, and everybody else laughed. And then uh, he said, OK, OK. <laughs> so anyway. He, uh, he didn't do it very much after that. <laughs> um, so uh, I've come to believe over, over the years that actually using obvious or trivial uh, is not the thing to do. Uh, and, uh, and my reasoning is as follows. Uh, for students for which it is obvious or trivial, uh, there's no need to tell them because it is obvious or trivial. For those uh, which it's not obvious or trivial, it just confuses them more. So there's really no pedagogical value for saying something is obvious or trivial, uh, obviously. 
Ed Dubinsky. Ed Dubinsky. He was my discrete mathematics teacher, again at Berkeley, uh, and he was a visiting professor at the time. Uh, I'll mention a couple things from his class. Uh, we were actually, this, was an actually an, this was actually an experimental section of discrete math. He was trying out all sorts of new ways of teaching discrete math, and so we were his guinea pigs. But one of the things he mentioned was the, this idea. Uh, we were, so discrete math is this hodgepodge collection of topics, uh, mathematical topics, that uh, are all important for computer science. Um, but it's hard sometimes to know what's what's what, and so he tried. You know, at the point where we were trying to, you know, where we were wondering what is this all for, uh, he he would he said something about the Karate Kid, this movie, the Karate Kid, which came out in 1984, and he basically said he, he said, look, the the movie Karate Kid is not a, a a movie about karate; it's a movie about teaching. Okay, so if you were, for those of you who've seen Karate Kid, uh, you know he trains for this big karate uh, competition and what he asks uh, Daniel the kid to do is to sand the floor paint uh, wash some cars and he does all this work and when he's supposed to be training for this karate competition and there's this pivotal scene where Daniel the kid learns that all the sanding and painting and whatever uh, was that he thought was useless was actually uh, training him to learn to karate and so that's what Dubinsky told us he said we're gonna learn all these little bits and then as the quarter comes towards the end we're gonna put it all together I don't know if it actually happened but anyway that's what he said so another thing that he did that was uh, kind of unusual was that we negotiated our grade at the end of the quarter. And I know that, that some places do that, but this was the first time and only time I'd ever had that happen to me. Um, so, uh, so we would have 15 or 20 minutes at the, uh, during finals week to, uh, you know, to talk. And so when, I, when my turn came up, I went to his office and he said, so uh, what grade do you think you deserve? <laughs> and I said, well, I think I uh, know all the material. Uh, you know, I think I mastered it. I think I deserve an A. And after a little more discussion, he said, uh, well, I think you should get an A+. Plus. And, well, I wasn't going to argue. Um, and, and, and he explained that he thought I had mastered the material, but uh, that I had gone beyond it. So it turns out at Berkeley, by the way, A pluses don't count for any more than an A in your GPA. So that really stinks. Anyway. I've never had the courage to try that in my teaching. I don't know, maybe some of you uh, in the social sciences or humanities have tried that, but anyway. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, and anyway. Okay, so that's that. Um, a few more comments about teaching. Again, these are, there's no particular rhyme or reason to these things. These are just things that, uh, that I thought are interesting. Um, for me, the number one concept regarding teaching is that explaining things is the foundation of teach, good teaching. Um, it doesn't matter what your teaching style is, in, in my mind. Straight teaching, discussion, flipping the classroom, online, pick your favorite teaching method. If you can't explain an idea clearly to students uh, so that they can understand, uh, pretty much nothing else matters. That's just my opinion. Uh, hopefully some of you share that opinion, but I don't know. Um, so when I hear somebody say he or she is a good teacher because you know she knows the material, I just kind of cringe. It's like, no, it's not because the person knows the material. It's because they are able to explain it that uh, makes them a good teacher. So, um, of course, you need to know something in order to explain it. Uh, well, uh, that may, not, may or not, may not be true. In academia, I should uh, qualify. In academia, uh, you should probably know something before you explain it. I think there, there, are, there are professions where it's actually to your advantage not to know what you're saying. Um, uh, but anyway, and there's plenty of smart people out there, but I think explaining is, is the key. It's a good teaching. All right, the Exploratorium. How many of you have been to the Exploratorium? Do you know what the Exploratorium Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, in San Francisco. Okay, that's, that's, that's my one and only feeble attempt today at interaction. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't, don't know about the Exploratorium, it's, there's the old Exploratorium and the new Exploratorium. So I'm going to be talking about the old Exploratorium because I don't know what's in the new Exploratorium. The Exploratorium is a hands-on science museum. It's in San Francisco. It used to be at the Palace of Fine Arts. Now it's along the, uh, one of the wharfs. Um, there, it, one of the exhibits at the old Exploratorium was this giant concrete cylinder. It's a solid mass of concrete. Okay? And around it is a sheath of iron. Okay, and I don't know how much it weighs, probably several hundred pounds, maybe a ton, who knows. Okay, and it's suspended from the ceiling by this very sturdy chain. 
okay? And so the idea is that it's, it's standing out there and it's suspended in space here by the chain and there's a little barrier that prevents you from going up there and hurting yourself. And so, but, there, uh, but the, near the barrier there, is a, there are some magnets with, with string attached to it, okay? And the idea is that you throw the magnets at this iron sheath and if you throw it just right, of course, it'll stick, okay? Um, and so it usually takes two or three tries to get it to stick. And then what happens? The goal here is to pull the magnet in such a way as to cause this multi-hundred pound or ton concrete thing uh, to move, okay? And so, you know, and the question is how do you do this? Well, of course, if you don't pull hard enough, it doesn't do anything. But if you pull too hard, the magnet falls off, okay? But if you do it just right, if you do it just right, uh, you do it kind of like a, when you swing on a swing. You, you pull it just a little bit and you feel the tension and you release. And if you do it, you know, a few times, the thing starts to move. It's pretty amazing. And why am I telling you this? Uh, because first of all, it's a fun story. But second, it's, um, I think of teaching a little bit like this. Um, you're trying to get students to move, whatever that means. And if you pull too hard, or if you push them to pull, push, I don't know. If you pull too hard on the string, uh, nothing happens. And if you don't pull hard enough, nothing happens. So finding, to me, finding that, that balance between the, uh, and the, the right energy uh, to make that happen is really, to me, the art and craft of teaching. So that's what I learned at the Exploratorium. Uh, just a couple words on competition and student achievement. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of competition as the primary motivator for students, uh, but I believe there is something to be learned by thinking about what it takes for students to excel uh, in competition. And I've listed three documentaries that maybe you, I'm almost certain uh, very few of you have seen or heard of. Um, but uh, here they are. The first one's called Debate Team. It's actually a documentary about how the University of California Berkeley debate team won the national championship in, in 2005. Um, uh, I'll just leave you to watch it. Uh, the, the, when I first watched this, uh, the, the first 10 minutes, I didn't even know what they were saying. I could not parse their words at all. So that's just that's a little teaser to try to get you. I have all these, by the way. You can, I can lend them to you. Second one is Hard Problems. It's about uh, mathema college mathem uh, mathematicians competing in the International Mathematical Olympiad. Uh, I forget where it was that year. I think it might have been in Russia somewhere. But anyway, this is uh, in 2006. The documentary was in 2008. Um, it's, that's a, it's a good documentary. Uh, finally, Winning Isn't Everything is a really good documentary about the University of North Carolina women's soccer team and how, uh, who've consistently done well. They've won 19, at the time of this documentary, they've won 19 national champions out of the 26 years that it has existed. It's okay. So, um, and the documentary basically attributes well, I don't know if it attributes, but it, there's probably some strong correlation between the, uh, the, their success competitively with the core values that, uh, that the team has and that the coach and the team put into practice every day. And those uh, values include hard work, teamwork, resiliency, and being positive. So there's, there's actually a list of 12 core values. So anyway, just a quick, quick thoughts on competition. Um, I can already see that this is going to go way over time. But anyway, but... Maybe that's good. Um, college teaching. Uh, active learning, uh, as I said, that, that's generally speaking is a good thing. Uh, but it can be done well. It can be done poorly. There's nothing magical about active learning. Um, at a conference in, uh, called SIGSI, which is the, uh, a national conference on computer science education, in 2006, uh, Rich Pattis uh, won an award there and he gave a speech and he actually uh, provided, he played some clips from these two movies, Dead Poet Society and The Paper Chase. And I'm pretty sure that he did The Paper Chase clip, but I'm not sure which clip he had from Dead Poet Society. But anyway, the, uh, uh, he, he, he showed these two clips and I want to show you these uh, couple clips here to illustrate various teaching styles, and, and as you probably have guessed, there's, it's, a, it's a, going to be a wide range here. Um, Dead Poet Society, for those who don't know, it's, uh, uh, it's set in the 1950s in an all-boys prep school, okay? Um, and uh, the main character, or one of the main characters, is a teacher, John Keating, and he teaches poetry, okay? That's his, uh, that's his, that's his subject. 
Now, he's teaching poetry to a bunch of boys that will likely go on to be doctors and lawyers and uh, businessmen. And so he's, what he's trying to do is to inspire them to break out of their, uh, their world and, and think for themselves. And so I want to start with this clip. Let's see. Here we go. Let's see if this works. Isn't technology great? Oh, oh I'm going to have to hit play. Okay, here we go. And you can pick your teeth with a little paw. <laughs> Why do I stand up here? Anybody? To feel taller. No. Thank you for playing, Mr. Dalton. I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. See, the world looks very different from up here. You don't believe me? Come see for yourselves. Come on. Come on. Just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Now, when you read, don't just consider what the author thinks. Consider what you think. Boys, you must strive to find your own voice. Because the longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it at all. Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Don't be resigned to that. Break out. Don't just walk off the edge like lemmings. Look around you. There. There you go, Mr. Christie. Thank you. Yes. Dare to strike out and find new ground. Now, in addition to your essays, I would like you to compose a poem of your own, an original work. Oh. Oof. La -ha -ha -ha. That's right. You have to deliver it aloud in front of the class on Monday. Oh. Bon chance, gentlemen. Mr. Anderson. Don't think that I don't know that this assignment scares the hell out of you, you mole. <laughs> Um, great, so that's uh, John Keating. And the second clip here is from the movie The Paper Chase, way back in 1973. And it's a movie about first year Harvard Law students uh, in, the, in the early 70s. Professor Charles Kingfield, Kingsfield, uh, in this clip, Charles Kingsfield is describing a, an ancient te teaching technique called uh, the Socratic Method. So I'll just play that. Uh, here we go. Let's see, let's do it this way this time. The study of law is something new and unfamiliar to most of you, unlike any schooling you've ever been through before. We use the Socratic method here. I call on you, ask you a question, and you answer it. Why don't I just give you a lecture? Because through my questions, you learn to teach yourselves. Through this method of questioning, answering, questioning, answering, we seek to develop in you the ability to analyze that vast complex of facts that constitute the relationships of members within a given society. Questioning and answering. At times, you may feel that you have found the correct answer. I assure you that this is a total delusion on your part. You will never find the correct, absolute, and final answer. In my classroom, there is always another question, another question to follow your answer. Yes, you're on a treadmill. My little questions spin the tumblers of your mind. You're on an operating table. My little questions are the fingers probing your brain. We do brain surgery here. You teach yourselves the law but I train your mind. You come in here with a skull full of mush and you leave thinking like a lawyer. So, like Rich Pattis in 2006, I, I'm, I'm kind of sometimes torn between this interactive hands-on approach of, of uh, John Keating and sort of the hard-nosed approach of uh, Professor Charles Kingsfield. 
I can't actually imagine using either one of those techniques in its pure form. Um, but my approach, I think, is to uh, blend techniques, partly because students um, don't always respond to the same, uh, to, in the same way, or, or just don't respond to, uh, in, to just one way of experiencing ideas, but also because there are different ways to experience these ideas, and I want, students to, I want to show students those ways the best I can. The larger question is, uh, that these movies raise, and all the movies that I've seen over the years, and I'm picking a, actually a very small percentage of the movies that I think are interesting in terms of teaching, um, is what does fiction tell us about reality? Oftentimes fiction is more real than reality because it condenses, right, and makes clear what really matters, uh, but does so in a concrete way with real characters and real uh, experiencing real life. Uh, reality, of course, is like that too, uh, but there's often details and distractions that sort of muddy the picture sometimes. Uh, there's a reason why we still read Huckleberry Finn in school. Well, maybe not all schools. Um, if you go online, you can find out who doesn't uh, teach Huckleberry, use Huckleberry Finn. I want to mention four books really quick uh, uh, that have influenced my thinking. Uh, one is Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, written in 1956. And, uh, okay, okay, this is off script. How many of you have heard of and know about Bloom's Taxonomy? Okay, good. All right, so I won't say anything about it. Good, I, I just gained, you know, five minutes on my talk. Um, there's a four, but perhaps what you don't know is that there's this volume that was published in 1994 called a 40 year retrospective on the Bloom's, on Bloom's taxonomy and it, it's a collection of essays on how Bloom's taxonomy has influenced has influenced teaching over the years and it talks about uh, teaching in uh, uh, I forget actually in uh, some country in Asia and Norway or Finland or something like that anyway there's a whole bunch of different uh, essays regarding the impact on Bloom's taxonomy and how it's been changed and modified and refined and whatnot it's a good read uh, William Perry uh, in, in the 1960s William Perry studied the intellect how many know have you know about William Perry uh, less so okay uh, in the 1960s William Perry studied the intellectual progression of students as they went through college he created a model for their development, so it's a developmental model. It's now called the, you might guess, the Perry model. Uh, in a nutshell, basically what he found was that students tend to go uh, from a dualistic black and white view of the world where, uh, uh, where basically everything is either right or wrong, statements are either right or wrong, to a more relativistic one where uh, there are so-called rules of adequacy that determine uh, the correctness of truth claims. And there could be different sets of rules. Uh, another thing that he found was that, uh, he found a lot of things, but I'm pointing out just a few things. Perry found that students tended to go from a view that, uh, that views the teacher as the unquestioned authority to a view that considers uh, these, uh, the teacher as somebody who understands and applies those rules of adequacy. Okay? If the teacher applies the rules of adequacy incorrectly, then they're just as wrong as anybody else who applies them incorrectly. Okay? And so students progress from that, uh, from that uh, sort of teacher as authority, uh, uh, unquestioned authority, to this more understanding of that, hey, there's criteria. So sometimes I ask myself, uh, how do I help my students in, uh, develop in that way? In other words, not just the con it's not just the content of the course that I'm trying to teach them. How am I helping them out in terms of providing a view of education and knowledge uh, that is more like the, so the rules of adequacy approach. Stephen Brookfield, he wrote this book, Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. This is probably, I think it is, I'll, I'll just say it, no, no probably is about this, uh, because I'm the authority, damn it. Um, we can edit that out, can't we? Anyway. It's the single most useful book on teaching I've ever read. Okay, why? Because it provides concrete advice on what what the teaching enterprise is all about, and more importantly, the lenses in which we can view our teaching. So, to become a, this critically reflective teacher. So, the lenses that he talks about are self-reflection, of course, um, uh, viewing our teaching from students' point of view, viewing our teaching from our peers' point of view, and finally, the literature. Okay. And so by his, the idea is that by looking at your teaching from all these different lenses, you get a much deeper and richer uh, understanding of what you're doing, okay? 
And this is a pretty, a pretty deep and thoughtful book. Uh, and so rather, than, I mean, I could spend a whole talk just on this book. Um, but instead, I'll just let you uh, read and enjoy. Another book that I read, uh, and this was just before reading the Brookfield book, was Parker Palmer's The Courage to Teach, 1997. Um, it opened my eyes to the possibilities of what could happen in a classroom. And it's, it's less of a nuts and bolts sort of book, but it's more philosophical. And some people have criticized it for being a little too uh, fuzzy and new age or whatever, but I think it's a great read. And I think it was perfect for me to read that book before reading the Brookfield book. So there's a little suggestion, hopefully, for uh, if you want to get some new ideas. Uh, advice to new teachers. Oh my gosh. Here we go. I'm just going to just going to blast through um, because we're, I see the time and it's scary. Oh, maybe, maybe this clock is deliberately faster to make me think that I'm actually have more, less time than I... Ah, I know. Ah, yes, it is. It's, actually, this is crazy. One of, well, one of them is dead, so, but this one here is, uh, is about five minutes faster, so maybe I actually have more time than I thought. So, okay, I probably don't need to say uh, too much about this. Really learn how to explain ideas to people. Uh, I've already told you that I think that explaining ideas to people is, is sort of the foundation of teaching. Uh, but since the World Series just ended today, uh, I'll, I'll use a baseball example. So uh, here's my, and you can adapt it to whatever you want. But So it, my, my exercise for you guys is explain the basic rules of baseball to someone who knows nothing about baseball. If you can do that, all right, that's good. Right? And it's, it's tough. I explained to my mom one time how baseball works, and it took me, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, because you have to, if they don't know anything about it, it's, it's, it's you know nothing about baseball, good. Okay, well, come to, come to my office, and, I, and you can, I can practice. Good. And then, if you get to that level, explain the infield fly rule, and why, it, why that rule exists. Seriously, that is a challenge. You have, and it's, it's not obvious why. It's, it's one thing to know the rule. It's an, another thing to know why the rule exists. Okay? And then explain the difference between interference and obstruction. If you can do that, you know, to somebody who no, knows nothing about baseball, I think you have mastered how to explain things. So pick your favorite topic. Pick something you know about, obviously, uh, and, and try that out. Or uh, another example of expl explaining things is... Uh, Explain how to get uh, uh, to one of our buildings on campus to, to say, a law student, someone who actually knows a little bit about the campus but just happens to be lost. And then explain how to get to that same building to someone who's never set foot on campus. I bet you the explanation is different. Okay? And what's my point here? You learn a lot about people by explaining things to people. Okay? Um, as people who have, for the most part, uh, done well in school, new faculty uh, forget what it's like to talk to non-experts. And so you really need to deconstruct your discipline uh, to help guide students in mastering it. And you also learn about a very important uh, uh, concept in teaching, which is pacing. The speed at which you talk and the speed at which you present material is so important. It's not about blasting all the material, although that's what I'm doing now. Uh, it's not about how much material can I blast, it's how much can they absorb. Uh, related to the explaining thing is develop your communication skills, speaking, writing, interpersonal. Don't obfuscate. I don't think I need to say much more about that. Um, learn about people. Another movie, Patch Adams. How many of you have seen Patch Adams? Oh, good. Some of you have. Patch Adams is a story about a medical student who realizes that medicine is more than just a, about diagnoses, anatomy, drugs, you know, uh, but also it's really about people. If you're going to treat people, you need to learn about people. And so he goes, so there's, there's a section of the movie that's really fun where he, he and his buddies go off and just try crazy things out in the middle of the street with total strangers. Like, you know, they jump out of trees and see how people react just to understand how, what, what people are made of. And so I'm not recommending that you, uh, try his particular way of learning about people. But I think the, the point here I'm trying to make is that uh, learning about how to deal with people is important in becoming a good teacher. Um, active learning, oops, wrong. Stephen Brookfield, read Stephen Brookfield, and then reflect on your craft using the four lenses. And take, uh, here's something, take student comments in aggregate seriously. It's easy to dismiss students' uh, comments, but uh, in aggregate, 
they usually tell you something. Active learning. <laughs> uh, so I, I've said that before, so I don't, I don't think I need to repeat myself here. And these are all good tips, but there's so much more. And so let's go to advice number two. Not all students come into your class with the same preparation or motivation. Intentionally provide opportunities in your course designed for all students to learn. So it didn't take me long to realize that students come in with different skills and skill levels and that students learn differently. Uh, but it took me longer to develop a way to design a course so that everyone uh, can benefit from my class, even the ones who eventually fail my class. So providing, and you know, at UW-Tacoma, and, and I suspect this is true at many, many universities, there's a wide range of students that come into your classes uh, in terms of skill and, you know, their backgrounds and whatever. This, of course, must be especially true at the freshman and sophomore level, but it happens even at the juniors and senior, junior and senior level. Um, here's a brief clip from Dead's, and I, I couldn't find a really good uh, clip about this, but anyway, this sort of gets at the idea that there are different students, uh, and they come in with different... Uh, views of what school is all about. So here we go. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Full screen. Oh, sorry. I, I need to tell you a little bit about this. This, is the, this, is, this scene happens right after uh, John Keating, the, the poetry teacher, uh, the first lecture of the uh, of his class. He gives his carpe diem speech, where he basically tells his students, you know, live life to the fullest because you know. Your life is short, and uh, it was kind of creepy because he's talking. He, he shows them pictures of all of these past students from from uh, the high school that they're going to, and 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 you know they're all dead and gone. And so he's saying he's urging them to live life. And so this is the scene right after they've had that they've had that uh, lecture, I guess. That was weird, but different. Spooky, if you ask me. Can you test us on that stuff? Oh, come on, Cameron. Don't you get anything? What? What? Uh, what else? Oh, hey, if you use humor in your teaching, which I recommend, never laugh at your own jokes. The reason is simple. The reason is the same reason why you never say obvious or trivial. <laughs> Read a book on teaching. Develop a philosophy of teaching. Then stand and deliver. What do I mean by that? When I say develop a philosophy of teaching, I don't mean the uh, usual mom and apple pie stuff, uh, inspiring students, motivating them to learn more, the active classroom, all that stuff. What I really mean by this is developing a philosophy that actually leads directly to how you go about. Uh, that drives your policies on grading, your grading practices, your attitudes towards students, how you organize your course in the classroom, who gets to speak in class and when, how groups in your class should operate if you have group work, how discussions should be conducted, what you expect of students, and what ex students can expect from you. Okay, Take that philosophy and, and really make it real. Okay, uh, Having been on a lot of uh, search committees, it's, it's, uh, my eyes glaze over when I read teaching philosophies. And uh, I would like to see more philosophies that really dug a little deeper. And this is where Parker Palmer, Stephen Brookfield, and William Perry can help a little bit. One of the exercises in Brookfield's book is to write down a rationale for your course, uh, for the way it's organized. Why is your course organized the way it is? What, tell me why are you doing these homeworks and why are we doing discussion? What is this course about and what do you, should you expect to learn from this class? And write this with, your, with the audience being your students. And then give them that one pager or two pager. Uh, give it to them on the first day of class. Have them read it. Okay? It's it may be the toughest thing you've ever done as a teacher to do that. So try it. Treat your students like potential future colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to say much here. Uh, that is just a suggestion, but I will refer you to this wonderful book called The No Asshole Rule by Robert Sutton. And the No Asshole Rule is a, a book about uh, management and, and, and job, uh, sorry, work, work climate. And uh, once you read it, you'll see what I mean <laughs> by, on this tip here. So I'll, once again, I will leave you with the pleasure of reading this. More advice. Try things out. Experiment. Be curious. 
There's a Cole Porter song called Experiment. And I, and if, I, if I had any kind of singing voice, I'd sing the song or the main thing. So again, go find, go find Experiment and look at the lyrics. Uh, the only way you can discover what works or what doesn't work and to grow as a teacher is to try things out, try different things out. But do so in a way that if the experiment fails, your students don't suffer too much uh, because their growth is also your responsibility. can be a lonely activity, teaching, but it doesn't have to be. Find people who like to talk about teaching, talk to them, <laughs> visit their classrooms, have them visit yours. Understand that your, your teaching takes place in a context. Your, course is in a, in your, your one course is not isolated from everything else. It's part of a curriculum that students get a degree for. Uh, your, the physical aspects of your class uh, room affect the way you teach, and uh, how your department or program talks about teaching affects how you teach. So find ways to make those contexts conducive to good teaching. Okay, that's the advice. I'm a little embarrassed actually to have this slide here, but I figure what the heck, full disclosure. Here are some books that I think I should have read, but I haven't. Um, and maybe some of you have read these books, so that's good. Uh, first one, Women's Ways of Knowing is actually a, uh, a follow-up to, uh, to the Perry, William Perry work. Uh, the, 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 the issue with William Perry was that uh, he, his students were all Harvard students, um, very uh, elite university, and they were all male. This was when Harvard was all male. So uh, the concern that these uh, folks had was that well, maybe, maybe the findings of, of William Perry don't necessarily apply to everyone. So they, they looked at, well, I don't know. I haven't read it, so I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but they, they broadened the population of, of people, of students. Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, I, I'm a little embarrassed that I haven't read, uh, read that. But uh, what, I, what little I know about it um, reminds me of the question of who owns knowledge and, and how, how does knowledge get created? And that's where this clip from a movie called Mona Lisa Smile uh, comes from. Mona Lisa Smile uh, stars Julia Roberts. How many of you have seen Mona Lisa Smile? Oh good, a few of you. Julia Roberts um, stars in it and she is uh, a professor, Catherine Ann Watson. Yes, that's who the Watson is. Um, she's a new professor and she's teaching art at uh, Wellesley College. So all, all, all girls, all female uh, college. And this is in the 1950s, remember. And so this clip is going to, you're going to see a lot of 1950s. But she's trying to teach her students art. And all these students have read all of the readings in the syllabus before the class has started. Yeah, these are all the students that we get here. Right? You got to so this, this, you should relate to this easily. Okay, here we go. What is that? You tell me. Carcass by Soutine, 1925. It's not on the syllabus. No, it's not. Is it any good? Hmm? Come on, ladies. There's no wrong answer. There's also no textbook telling you what to think. It's not that easy, is it? All right, no. It's not good. In fact, I wouldn't even call it art. It's grotesque. Is there a rule against art being grotesque? I think there's something ag aggressive about it. And erotic. Mm -hmm. To you, everything is erotic. Yeah, everything is erotic. Girls. <laughs> Aren't there standards? Of course there are. Otherwise, a tacky velvet painting could be equated to a Rembrandt. Hey, my Uncle Freddy has two tacky velvet paintings. He loves those clowns. <laughs> there are standards, technique, composition, color, even subject. So if you're suggesting that rotted side of meat is art, much less good art, then what are we going to learn? Just that. You have outlined our new syllabus, Betty. Thank you. What is art? what makes it good or bad, and who decides. Next slide, please. 
Twenty-five years ago, someone thought this was brilliant. I can see that. Who? <laughs> My mother. I painted it for her birthday. <laughs> Next slide. This is my mom. Is it art? It's a snapshot. If I told you Ansel Adams had taken it, would that make a difference? Art isn't art until someone says it is. It's art. <laughs> the right people? Who are they? Betty Warren. We're so lucky we have one of them right here. <laughs> Could you go back to the soutine, please? Just look at it again. Look beyond the paint. Let us try to open our minds to a new idea. Hmm? All right, back to chapter three. Has anyone read it? Once I had a Oh, sorry. Uh, Teaching is a subversive activity. Uh, what the best college teachers do. There's a couple other books that I haven't quite read yet. I've read bits and pieces of what the best college teachers do. I want to move towards the bigger questions now. I know I'm running, starting to run out of time here. Actually, I'm way behind now. Um, Declining by Degrees and Ivory Tower are two uh, documentaries. Uh, Declining by Degrees uh, looks at the challenges that higher, both documentaries actually, look at the challenges that higher education faces uh, with ever, uh, having to teach ever-growing numbers of students. Uh, and I'm sad to say that the problems and issues that are outlined in Declining by Degrees in 2005 have really not gotten much better. And uh, so many of the same themes appear in the Ivory Tower uh, documentary. Um, the End of Education is a book by Neil Postman, and it's focusing on K-12, um, but many of the lessons there, or many of the ideas apply to edu higher education. For me, the most provocative idea that, uh, is, that he had in uh, the book is that we have built our educational system, and remember he's mostly focusing on K-12, around ideas that he calls gods. Uh, so according to Postman, uh, two gods that work together to undermine education are the god of consumership, that is that buying things is good, and the god of economic utility, the view that people are basically work units, and the two actually work together uh, and, and feed off each other. Uh, so without spoiling the whole book, I hope I've piqued your interest uh, on this enough to read his book. Uh, at Berkeley is a documentary, uh, 2013. Uh, it's a, huh, it's a four-hour documentary. Four hours, yes, four. <laughs> That's 240 or so minutes. Um, it consists of a number of long scenes, live scenes uh, on campus uh, at, at, that represent different aspects of university life. Um, of course, there are classroom scenes, but there's also staff meetings on how to deal with student protesters, uh, pep rallies before football games, what goes on inside a research lab. It's pretty much a slice of life uh, sort of thing. Uh, and you can see a lot of the same activities here uh, in that documentary as, as you would find here at UW Tacoma. Um, the clip I have uh, for you here is actually the then chancellor talking about tenure cases and then he has a thought about teaching which I thought was kind of interesting and I thought I'd share with you so let's go to that we cannot be a great university if we don't have a great faculty and it is not the department heads responsibility to ensure that every single person they hire gets tenure, because not every single person works out uh, and shouldn't get tenure. And, and it's your responsibility, and it shouldn't be ours, uh, to act as, as, uh, as, as, a, as a veto. So I just urge you to exercise critical judgment on tenure cases. And please don't send us a case that starts out saying, I'm pleased to you know, forward a really outstanding candidate for tenure, and then you read through uh, and uh, for scientists, and, uh, scientists, for example, you know, you go on the net and you see, okay, what impact has the person's work actually had? Uh, and if a case is, uh, if you think the person is much better than the case uh, uh, presents, explain it. I mean, be honest about it. Uh, it will serve that person and you much better if, you're, if you present honest cases. Uh, and I have a personal passion, which some of you know about, 
which is that I understand is not uniformly shared by all of you, this passion, <laughs> and that is that, that I think, of course, we need to use chairs to honor our great faculty, which usually means our great researchers, but we also need to honor great teachers beyond the teaching award. Uh, and so one of the, my ambitions is that we will have a set of chairs which will go to people whose primary achievement is great teaching. They also have to be good researchers, good scholars, but where the recognition really is for the fact that they are great classroom teachers. Uh, and so uh, we hope to raise a set of chairs which will help us create a collegium of great teachers. This is one of our ambitions, is to have multidisciplinary chairs where, where part of the income from the chair, part will be used for usual purposes, but part will be used to fund creative ventures in the classroom. Uh, and so we're very excited. Interesting idea. Uh, this, uh, what I, I should have done was actually had the next five seconds or ten seconds of this where he says, if you, know, uh, if you as faculty know of any alumni uh, or others who are willing to donate money to, uh, to build these chairs, uh, please let me know. So I, I, I wish I, anyway. Oh boy, now we're just like ridiculously over time now. Um, Why Teach is a book I came across uh, earlier this, this year. It's written by Mark Edmondson. He is a, an English professor at the University of Virginia. And it's a collection of essays on teaching, which I think it, uh, are really great. And what I'd actually like to do is to read a part of, of one of the chapters entitled uh, The Corporate City and the Scholarly Enclave. Um, he begins the chapter, I, I'm going to start reading some from the middle. Uh, he begins the chapter by talking about, uh, by asking the question, where should you go to college? And so he's kind of thinking about his audience, I guess, as a, a high school student. He responds to that question with another question in the great Socratic method, uh, with another question, which is, are you looking for a corporate city or a scholarly enclave? So in this chapter, he talks about how high school students these days are on a credentials treadmill, uh, trying to find that right balance between good grades and extracurriculars. They're making strategic decisions about whether or not to read the, the, book, the whole book for English class, or whether to volunteer two hours at the hospital or four hours at the soup kitchen. Okay? Uh, but then he also talks about Mario Savio, a student and activist at Berkeley, who stood up at Sproul Plaza and basically said, we're not products, we are human beings. That we're not, well, you know, we're not, so going back to this idea of the uh, god of economic utility, right? We're not, we're not just economic units. So I don't necessarily agree with everything that Edmondson says here, but his ideas have certainly made me think. So I'm going to read from the, from the, uh, from the middle of the here. So some rising high school seniors may be ready for more of the same, assuming that what I've said about American high schools is now right or half right. And if so, they need to apply to and eventually install themselves in the kind of college I call the corporate city. What do you get there in the corporate city? You get more of the same. Everyone is on the make. Everyone is trying to succeed. A tremendous amount of networking goes on because people have come to realize that as this old saying runs, it's often not what you know, but who you know. Students still study, but in the old high school tradition, you study only as much as you need to study to get your A's. If expedient but slightly shady means of A getting arise, you may even evaluate them using a risk-reward equation. That is, you balance what, you can be gained, what can be gained against the pains of getting caught. And even if you don't cheat per se, you're always ready to cut academic corners. Do I really need to read all of King Lear to ace the test? Probably you don't. At a certain point, tragic inevitability being what it is, you probably know what's going to happen to the king and to Cordelia, too. When in doubt, turn to the spark notes or the cyber equivalent thereof. You'll have to get by on only a little sleep, but there are ways to make that possible, possible. some of them quite legal, and others semi-legal. Legal, that is, for the person for whom the Adderall prescription was originally written, but perhaps not legal for you. You'll be awake and alert for as much as 20 hours of the 24 hours during a hypercharged version of what you did in high school. You'll be meeting people, connecting with future allies for the wars of life, succeeding in your courses, engaging in lots of activities. In short, you'll be doing more than building your resume. You'll be putting your resume on steroids. Universities that have made themselves into corporate cities are not hard to spot. Most of the students, and many members of the faculty, are buzzing from place to place, always feeling a bit self-important, always feeling a bit behind, like that poor rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. The people who represent corporate universities to you, the tour guides and the rest, will talk a lot about new computer initiatives, about partnering with business, and about the creation of young leaders. They'll talk about recent grads who have hit the Silicon Valley jackpot. These are near kids who have 
uh, who have made pots of money and, one feels this by implication, are soon going to spread some of it uh, around their former school, to which they are extremely grateful. You'll hear the word excellence about a billion times. Now, even in the middle of corporate universities, you will find people who are not playing the game. These are not necessarily people who don't show up at a boring class, who smoke a lot of weed, who read books that aren't assigned, who play in bands with bizarre names, and who wear t-shirts that are distressingly original, though sometimes they are. But what truly characterizes people who are, who are living in or want to live in, uh, sorry, but what truly characterizes people who are living in or want to live in a scholarly enclave, it's pretty simple, really. They are at school seeking knowledge so as to make the lives of other human beings better. They will not tell you this when you ask them about it in casual conversation, but it's true. They want to be teachers and scientists and soldiers and doctors and legal advocates for the poor. They want to contribute to something to curing cancer. They want to make sure the classics of Roman literature don't die. They want to get people excited about the art of Picasso and maybe inspire people to make some Picasso-inspired art of their own. They want to be sure that when a foreign nation is inclined to threaten, I mean really threaten, the peace of the United States of America, that nation has to think twice and twice again. Do these people want some recognition? Do they want to get paid? Yes, in varying degrees they do. There are very few people who are entirely unselfish in the world and sometimes they don't live too long. But the people I'm talking about often put others first. They have a love for humanity in them and it is this love that chiefly motivates what they do, even if they don't tell you so every five minutes. They want to make the world better and they are honest with themselves about doing this. They know that any quest that involves status and enrichment is dangerous and that it can take them away from what really matters. They know that the human capacity for self-deception is boundless, and they are always on the lookout for the moment when their pride has eclipsed their love for the world. How do you find these people, and how do you find the schools where they're plentiful, what I've called the scholarly enclaves? That is, how do you find them if they are what you are looking for? You visit, you look, and you listen. When people start talking about leadership and incentives, and especially something called incentivizing, and becoming an academic entrepreneur, you're probably in the wrong place. Whenever people make fritters of English, I dare say that you're in the wrong place. When people talk about innovation and partnering with big money institutions, I would advise you to run. If you hear the word excellence more than twice in a sentence, you are hereby empowered to pop the speaker twice, but very gently, in the nose. Why is excellence a bad word? It's not in and of itself, but the people around universities who use it are people who want to talk about worldly distinction without talking about ethics. Excellence means we're smart, we're accomplished, we're successful, and we can be these things without any obligation to help our fellow human beings. When colleges start talking about humane excellence or generous excellence, then I'll want to listen. You also have my permission, in fact my encouragement, to gently snout pop people who talk about leadership. Why is leadership so bad? In itself it's not, but what people usually mean by a leader now is someone who, in a very energetic, upbeat way, shares all the values of the people who are in charge. Leaders tend to be little adults, little grown-ups who don't challenge the big grown-ups who run the place. Grown-ups, people like me, need to be challenged and we rely on young people to do it. When people say leaders nowadays, what they mean is gung-ho followers. As an English professor, I don't really care for Mario Savio's grammar and diction, but, he, but was he an authentic leader? Was he someone who offered students a new and controversial way to think of their lives and then to live their lives? Yes, I think that he was. But no college dean or president, now or ever, would use the word leader to, to describe Mario. Most of them would reserve the word for followers, for people who follow them. The residents of scholarly enclaves are harder to spot than the denizens of the corporate university, and I can't give you a definitive field guide to finding them. But I'll say first that they don't talk about being a leader and being an entrepreneur. They're ta they talk about working in a lab or developing a questionnaire for, a psychological re for psychological research or writing a novel or getting people who don't belong in jail out of jail or defending their country against its enemies. And they're not smiling all the time. They are aware of the enormous gap between what humans aspire to and what remains to be done. They tend to take joy in their work, but they never feel that they have quite gotten it right. The people in the corporate university are forever pleased with themselves. They're always succeeding getting A's that will soon be converted into dollars. Their view is often uh, that everyone who want, uh, wants the same things that they do. They think that people who claim to work for humanity want wealth and fame too. The achievers are, the achievers are just more honest about the matter. The people who serve the poor themselves want to be rich. They're just too chicken to be candid about their desire and then in the current vernacular to go for it. 
And who knows, maybe this is true. This view has some important upholders, Freud and Nietzsche, and in his way, Adam Smith, feed it, and they are anything but fools. But geniuses are not always right. The people who dedicate themselves to helping humanity are not, let me say, sacrificing themselves to a life of pain and sorrow. In fact, it is only through unselfish effort on behalf of something larger than yourself that anything like happiness arises. The happiness through material goods and success industry, by the way, that's all hyphenated, happiness through material goods and success industry has to throw ads at you 24 hours a day to persuade you that its way of life is the best one. The happiness industry protests too much. Would it need to be uh, as clamorous about it uh, as it is about consumer bliss if there really was such a thing as consumer bliss? Where should a young person now go to college? It depends. Does she want more of, a, more of the good American high school with its hustle and bustle, its striving for excellence, its fixation on leadership, its partnering and incentivizing and getting proactive and succeeding and succeeding and succeeding? Or does she want something else? Pretty thought-provoking, huh? Advice revisited. Learn about people, explain, 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 reflect, experiment, develop a real uh, philosophy. Dare I suggest these principles in red here uh, can be adapted to research and, and management in general. I want to challenge all of us to, think, uh, con to consider the following. In light of Edmondson's ideas, what does it mean to teach in college? I think that's a tough question. And in light of the fictional teachers I've shown you today, the Keatings, the Kingsfield, and the Watsons, what fictions do you want to turn into reality? The future of higher education depends on how we answer these questions and many more questions. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> have, I, have I stunned you with, I, I'm, I might send an email to Mark Edmondson saying, hey, you know, uh, everyone was just like mesmerized. <laughs> I actually contacted him uh, about this, about reading this aloud. I wanted to sort of get his blessing to make sure that he didn't think that, oh, I don't want you reading my stuff. But he, he was okay with it. Questions, comments? Beth. Could you share with us one of your most um, uh, mind boggling teaching experiences? Like, is there, was there a point of moment, perhaps humiliating, but, oh. <laughs> but taught you a lot? Oh, that's a good question. So the question is uh, is there a mind blowing or uh, uh, sort of. Uh, important time in which I, I learned something about teaching or it was just embarrassing or whatever, right? Um, hmm, this has been a lot. <laughs> uh, I think when I taught in the core here the first year, that was certainly eye-opening. We had a lot of students and uh, they all came with different, different skills again. And in fact, in, in the particular course that I had, uh, I, I actually co-taught it with Amos Nascimento. And uh, we were, so that was a new experience for me as well, co-teaching. So at, at all different levels, it was, very, it was very different for me. But the different skill levels and different maturity levels, we had most of our students were 18, 19 years old, fresh out of high school. And yet we had a couple students who were 23, 25. And it was interesting to talk to them about how they uh, perceived the other students in the class. And of course, uh, as you might suspect, uh, he noticed the, the relative immaturity of the, other, of the other students. I mean, this is a guy, it turns out this guy had gone, had served in Iraq and, you know, did however many years of service there and came back. And so uh, I suspect that he had a very different view of life than, than the others. So, uh, yeah, so that, that was a challenge. And I, I, I'm not sure what I learned from it other than that, wow, you've got to be prepared for anything. Um, and I, I suspect... Uh, uh, you as an advisor have similar uh, sorts of experiences. Um, and, and, and yeah, actually now that, now I think about it, you know, the, you, I was talking about William Perry, this developmental model, attitudes towards school, attitudes towards teachers and attitudes and where they come from. 
Um, I think you you probably have to deal with that more uh, that aspect of of, of uh, college life than, than professors do. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, I taught up in Seattle, uh, introductory computer science class up in Seattle. Okay, so this was an eye-opening experience. Uh, 250 students. Okay, there were two sections. Once again, I was kind of co-teaching. There were two sections, and I taught the uh, he my co-teacher taught in the morning section at 9 or whatever and then I taught at 11 okay so I and he had been teaching this course for a long long time and and I had, this was the first time I had taught it so I would watch his lecture and try to sort of replicate or simulate the same kinds of things that he was doing in the in the second hour uh, so I had an hour in between and it's like I'm trying to replay the entire lecture in my mind uh, during that hour in between and then I'd go on go on for, for me but 250 students it was just a C a sea of people, uh, I, and I tell the story, and it's true that I, I think by the end of the course, I learned six students' names out of the 250. Now we had 14 TAs and five lab assistants, and we had weekly meetings. And so when I came here, uh, it was it was amazing because I was reflecting that hey, our weekly meetings, our weekly staff meetings, are as big as some of our classes that we've got here. So it it was it's quite a shock, but it, I I learned a lot actually in that in that experience. I, one of the things I learned was I don't want to teach 250 students ever again <laughs> in a single class. Um, um, but anyway, so those are some of the things I've learned. And, and some of the things that sort of have defined my teaching experience. I was a, something I took out of my talk was my experience as an uh, undergrad as a TA and as a lab assistant. Those were some very important years for me in learning how to explain things. I, I taught, I was a lab assistant for a computer programming course for non-majors, non-computer science majors. It was in fact mostly business uh, students. And um, that it really, you know, some students were very sharp. They, they, were, they, were, they got the stuff and it was like great, but then Students who were struggling, just explaining things it was really challenging. And it's actually easier, I think, as an undergraduate to explain all uh, that very introductory stuff because by the time you become a professor, uh, you know, you've, it's been many, many years and many years removed, and it's it's harder to recapture and understand what it takes to explain to somebody who's seeing, you know, doing computer programming for the first time. So, so those were some of the most interesting teaching experiences for me that sort of formed who I am as a teacher. Any other questions? Really? Come on. <laughs> Just like the model, the model, uh, not the model, more like the stereotypical uh, students. Yes, Richard. I, I saw the uh, movie uh, Ivory Tower yes. uh, recently. Uh, and it was uh, what, I mean, it was a lot of think so too. Uh, I think in, for example, in that class where I had 250 students, I had no idea who showed up any, on any given day. Although you could just tell by the sort of the sheer numbers whether you had 10, you know, 10 percent absent or 20 percent absent or in the middle of the quarter maybe as much as 30 percent absent. Um, with small classes like we have here at UW Tacoma, it's pretty easy to spot when somebody is, when someone's not in class. And so I think the challenge as a teacher is to design your class so that it encourages uh, attendance. So one of the things I do in uh, one of my classes is there's pretty much something due or there's an activity or something pretty much every day. <laughs> okay, so that's one way to encourage students to show up. Now I can't force them not to sleep in the back, uh, but you know I think with our small classes it's you know the peer pressure or the just 
you know, it would be noticeable, and I think that would be kind of embarrassing. Um, the other thing I do, I mean, the other part of it of what I'll call good teaching is making it interesting enough so that students will want to listen and, and, and find it engaging. So if you find half your class is sleeping in the back, well, it, probably something's wrong. <laughs> now, uh, but, you know, one or two, I'm not so concerned about. Life happens, right? People might have had a rough night. They stayed up all night studying for the other class or whatever, you know, so I'm not going to question it. But, but if it's a pattern, then, then I start to get worried. And um, that's when maybe a, a small intervention, send an email, hey, are you doing all right? You know, I noticed you're sleeping in the back. <laughs> okay, I've never had to do that. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of what I would, I think I would do if, I, if we're encountering that situation. So yeah, with the freshmen, that was, a, that was an interesting thing. I don't think I had anyone sleeping in the back, but there were definitely people who were you know, doing other things other than listening to what we were talking about or engaging in whatever discussion we had. That's, I don't, I never figured that out. <laughs> that's, that's hard. I, you, I think you have to talk to the people who regularly teach uh, freshmen and sophomores to, uh, to get their insights on, on how to deal with that. Um, I think we have some in, in the room here. <laughs> anyway. Any other questions? Do you want, oh, I should mention, I have made a list of all the movies and books that I have mentioned in this in this thing, and a couple more. So if any of you want this list, I have made 30 copies. Um, so I, I've even put a couple other ones. Uh, uh, for you mathematicians out there, there's this other wonderful collection of essays called Essays in Humanistic Mathematics. Uh, it's just fantastic. That's where I first learned about William Perry, by the way. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> Thanks.